Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. We do appreciate your time. We know that this takes time out of your uh, time in your facility, so we appreciate it. We hope to make it worth your while. And um, if you have throughout this presentation any questions, please feel free to ask them. It's supposed to be conversation and not uh, lecture. So uh, with, that, with that, we'll start on the big topic for today, process heating efficiency. So. What are we going to talk about first is um, many of you have already seen this. Um, fortunately, you can come to more than one workshop. But for those who haven't been on the work, in the workshops before, um, just a reminder that Enbridge provides what we call demand-side management um, a program for our industrial customers for more than 20 years now. We are mandated by Ontario Energy Board to do that. And as such, please feel free to use our services that are free to you. Um, and those services include all sorts of uh, advisory uh, services, uh, like a consulting services for you in energy efficiency. We provide financial incentives for the either audits and or studies. And we provide also financial incentives on the projects implemented that lead to the annual gas savings. So feel free to take advantage of those services. Um, we like to think that we understand the industrial customer. Um, unlike the residential and the commercial customer, industrial customer has a certain needs that need to be um, taken care of. Um, we have all, most of us that you've seen in the white shirts, we have all come from industries of different sorts. So we are not hardcore utility people, as it were. We all worked in the facilities before. We try to understand your point of view and try to work with it. In, in the end, our services are designed to help you build a business case to make energy efficiency decisions go through and also to al allow us to have long-term partnership and success. Because as you know, Enbridge is only um, uh, uh, sort of like a franchised area is uh, fixed. So we can go and look for new customers. Customers that are in our area, that's what we deal with. We don't go to Union Gas Territory. We don't go anywhere else. So we try to be long-term partnerships because we know that this is something that's going to go year after year after year with the same customers. So we do appreciate your business, and we try to build that partnership rather than a contractual relationship. So how do we do this? Um, many of you have seen very similar thing um, in your plan, do, check, act, um, lean manufacturing principles. We use the same principles. We start with the knowledge development, which is these type of workshops, our uh, newsletters, um, that tries to raise awareness amongst uh, our customers how to make energy efficiency decisions. We also try to identify some opportunities within your facilities. We will come uh, to your facility, we will walk through with you, and we'll try to find opportunities where can we save energy in your particular case, thermal energy. So, we do that through either testing or just walk through audits or by uh, supplying a financing for the third party audit. We also provide some measurement activities. We can either subsidize your uh, meters that you have in your facilities that you purchase for yourself, or we have a couple of meters that we can loan to you for gas and water as well. We provide engineering analysis. Um, in addition to experience in the industrial field, all of our uh, team members are engineers. So they all understand engineering analysis. They're very good at it. And we have also a backup uh, in the office, experts in the field that can help us if, you, if we need any help. All of that is to actually implement the project. And that's up to you. Ultimately, all of these activities that we uh, listed here lead to implementing the project. But if that doesn't happen, that's not a bad thing. As long as the, we raise the awareness and you know about it the next time. Because we all know that capital investment is not always up to us. It's not always up to you. There's other corporate decisions to be made. But if we make a good business case and corporate says, no, this is not good for this year, at least we made an effort. We brought it to their attention, and it's their decision what to do with it. We will do the best we can to make a, as good business case so they can say yes as many times as possible. But ultimately, it is your decision whether you proceed with the project or not. And all those services are free to you regardless whether you proceed with the project or not. So from our perspective, we think we're good at it. 
we saved about 110 million cubic meters of natural gas to our customers, uh, 20 uh, million kilowatt hours of electricity, and uh, just about uh, over 800,000 cubic meters of water to our customers through participation in our programs alone. And that was in the three-year period alone. We've been around for 20 years. So. And of course, for you, in addition to savings, in improving the bottom line, you also save CO2 emissions by reducing your natural gas usage. And when we say reducing natural gas usage, it doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to reduce what you use today. If you make a decision to buy a piece of equipment, it might be a decision to buy more efficient equipment rather than the equipment that you would have gone with anyways. So that also counts against the savings. That's also avoided CO2 emissions in the future. So that's it for the program. If you have any questions on the program itself, please feel free to ask any one of our ESCs. They can give you incentive levels. They can give you how uh, they can help you. All of them have assigned accounts, so feel free to talk to them to see how that applies to you. Now we'll go to the process heating itself um, and efficiency in process heating. When we started making this uh, presentation, we thought about, well, process heating is a very complex subject. And for each one of you, process heating means something different. So the, the idea of this uh, workshop is to give you basics, to give you an idea of what, when we strip all the complexity out of process, what's left. And what I'm hoping to, to impart on you today is to, to give you an idea that all the processes ultimately can be summed down to very few basic principles, regardless how complex they are. That's not to minimize the complexity of your own process. But that's to realize that the changes in the process heating efficiency can be had without impacting your base process and without making that a risk for the co company as, as a whole. So in, in usual definition of process heating, there's a whole bunch of definitions. But, but usual definition in the industry, when you talk about process heating, people talk about ovens and furnaces. That's number one what comes to mind. So if you don't have oven and furnace, you're like, well, I don't have process heating. Well, that's not necessarily true. Because what if we expand the definition? What if we say process heating is using thermal energy to shape or convert raw material into your products? Right? Whatever those products may be. So if your product is making a barbecue steak, that's process heating at that moment for you. Because your process is barbecuing a steak. If your process is cooking your soup, process heating is in impacting energy to the soup. Anything can be process heating. So if we say that process heating is application of heat to the products as, at large, that now opens application spectrum, opens up how we think about process heating in large. We can say that it still relates to ovens and furnaces, yes. But now we're adding process air heating, which is distinct from heating and ventilation, for example, in this room, and process water heating. And to give you an, an idea, process air heating, for example, is one of the largest costs for energy in automotive assembly. Like, you wouldn't think that, but it is. By far, they process hundreds of thousands of CFM of air and heat it up in their paint process. Hundreds of thousands. Everything else pales in comparison from the thermal energy perspective. Right? So that's, for them, that's process. Taking cold air, making it warm to apply it somewhere. That is process. Process water heating. Many people use process water everywhere on the planet. We have a windshield manufacturer that uses process water to rinse the windshields, to wash the windshields, to collect that water, to reheat it. They use thousands of pounds of water every hour for 8,000 hours a year. For them, that heating of water used in the process is process heating. And I'm sure when we talk about it now in these general terms, you can find your process in these uh, definitions. And that's one of the things that I want to impact here, to say that anything that you do with your material, with your product, you use energy every single time. 
However you use it, that we will call process heating for this purpose. And as we go through this, you will find some of the formulas and you'll say, oh, this is way too simple for me. Yes, but when you really think about it, it comes down to very simplicity of the process. It is not that complicated. So we talked about it already. Lots of people will say, well, that's too specialized, too many specialists that you can't help us out in this, or not possible to understand fine points about my process, or risk to my core process is too great to make any changes. All of those are valid statements. As I said, we all come from the industry. I have been in the industry for 20 years. I have had my share of good and bad experiences when I touch something in the process. But ultimately, we're here trying to help you out how to make the changes that you think are impossible to make. And one way to do this is to say, OK, be a little bit of a, we have to invoke a little bit of a John Lennon in ourselves and imagine things. How do we go about in the future? If you have a, pro a process today that runs at 400 degrees F, you have to imagine it. Can it run at 380 degrees F? Doesn't mean that you have to go right down on the line and play with the buttons. But imagine it. Can it, can it run? Quantify what that means to you. And then once you have a quantification, then you can go to the boss and to the management and say, if we can do this, this is potential savings. That makes huge difference to the management. Because now you have come to them with the reason why they should even consider changes. If you just say, I want to change this, they'll be like, OK, nice. But that's really dangerous, so no, you're not going to play with it. But if you go, I want to change this because there's potential to save $100,000 every year, now they may actually say, oh, well, OK, then let's spend $20,000 investigating this. And in addition to that, you know, you have us as your help. We can help you out. So when we talk about heating efficiency, it really is not that complicated. It comes down to working with very few things, trying to impact to the management, what is it that we're trying to change, and what is that going to result? What, what benefit are we going to get by doing that? So how do we defi define heating efficiency to start with? So now that we know what the process heating is, how do we define heating efficiency? Minimum heat to meet product's quality requirements over energy we invest into a process. That's basic heating efficiency. How much heat do we really need to change our product into sellable product versus energy that we invest into the process? So if your product is for, if, if you need to dry one pound of water, how much energy theoretically you need to, dry, to evaporate one pound of water? divided by all the energy that you buy to put into that process. That's your heating efficiency. If you do it this way, you will find that very few processes go over 30%. 30%. So now that we know how, what are we after, we can really look at two key methodologies to define the process heating efficiency. One is energy balance. And energy balance focuses on identifying the losses in the system. So we take our gross input energy, and we have something that we call heat to load, which is essentially the heat or thermal energy that goes into your product to convert it from the raw material into the end product for that particular operation. So in the background, you can see, for example, paint line. It's a curing oven. You put the powder on the, on the paint parts, painted parts, goes into curing oven, and you want that powder to now become solid protection for the part. How much energy does it require to turn that, to cure that powder? That's all you need. That's your heat to load. There is a whole bunch of losses, and the energy balance will focus on identifying those losses, essentially. So that's, that's approach number one. 
Another principle that we're going to uh, talk about today that's very important for your process is heat exchanger effectiveness. And this one is focusing on transferring heat. Unlike the first one that was focusing on losses, this one focuses on transferring the heat the most efficiently. So we all know that in the heat exchanger we have a hot side, we have a hot fluid that goes from hot temperature as it goes through the system, comes on the other side, slightly lower temperature. On the other side, we have a cold side. We have a cold stream of energy that we heat through this hot side by exchanging energy. <coughs> so that's a basic principle of every heat exchanger. But the principle can be applied to as wide a range as, for example, combustion efficiency. If you replace temperature of the hot side going out with your exhaust temperature on, on a, say, boiler, the, more the higher temperature of the boiler, the less energy you transferred or exchanged between hot and the cold side, the lower the efficiency of your boiler. It's the same principle. Formulas are slightly different, but the principle is the same. The hotter this, the hot medium gets out of the system, that means that the less energy you used out of it, it means your energy efficiency is lower. Simple as that. In addition to that, we will use two very common formulas. Um, as, as we have new people join our team, I keep telling them half jokingly, half seriously, these are the only two formulas you need to know. And when you think about it a little bit, that's true. First formula will tell you what's the energy required to change the temperature of product's mass. And it's as simple as saying that energy is mass times specific heat times delta D. That's formula number one. Formula number two is, of course, energy required to evaporate water, because that's the, what most of you deal with. But it can be energy required to change the state of any material. Those two formulas will cover probably 95% of your process heat when it gets down to it. That's not to minimize the impact, as I said, of the fine points of your process. Your processes are very complex, and there's many, many factors that can change or impact the process. But as I said, we're not worried about those factors. We are de only dealing with what if I can change the temperature from one to another? What if I can change the flow from one to another? What if I can minimize the losses? None of those change the basic fundamental principle of your process. So the rest of the formulas that you will be using, in addition to the other two, are usually there to, to put the rest of the inputs into perspective. So we said it's mass times specific heat times delta T. So the rest of the formulas will deal with calculating volumes, cal converting flow to mass, converting one energy type to another, to get you to that basic input for those two formulas. That's all it is. So let's go back to the energy balance approach as, as a first, first approach. Uh, it, it, as we said, it focuses on identifying and quantifying energy flows. And we'll do that to find out where the energy actually goes in the system. So if you have a process oven, we have energy input into the process oven. And this energy input, we call gross energy input, or the total energy going into the system, what you buy to put into that system. So you have, in our case, usually a burner that generates that gross energy input. Everything you put into the burner, the natural gas you buy to feed into the burner is your gross energy input. Right away, there is something, once you burn that natural gas, there is something that's called net fuel input. So we already see that we lose some of it, and that's at the very minimum, it's moisture losses, because you usually don't use those. The, the vapor that is generated in the combustion process, it gets lost in the exhaust as water. So unless you condense it out, you lose that. And it's usually about 8 to 10%. So as soon as you start, you're 10% down. Don't you love entropy? Further to that, we have something that's available heat. So not only did we lose moisture in the exhaust, we have some other exhaust losses. 
there is some air volume that gets just along for the ride. Because you have to remember what the combustion actually is. Combustion reacts, fuel reacts to oxygen. And as we all know, oxygen only represents about 21% of the air that we put into the system. So 79% of air is hydrogen. Very inert. Not nitrogen, sorry, not hydrogen. <laughs> uh, thank you. Nitrogen, which is an inert gas. You heat it up, but doesn't do anything for your energy. It doesn't burn. It doesn't react to anything. It just goes along for the ride and picks up the energy that goes from, say, 70 degrees ambient to 350 degrees exhaust. Those are your exhaust losses. So all you have to deal with to start with is this available heat. So you're already down about anywhere between 20 and 30%. On the energy output side, what you get out of it now out of that available heat. You have stored energy. If you have some sort of oven or dryer or something, some of, a small part of that energy will be stored in that system. So you don't have to keep heating it up from 70 to 150 degrees. It usually stays at that temperature. That's that stored energy. Then you have shell losses. We all know when we pass by the ovens or dryers and you walk by, you can feel some heat going. Those are shell losses. Then you have opening losses. You have to put the material through in the oven somewhere, and you have to take it out somehow. Usually, those openings are not closed. And if they are closed when new, uh, based on my experience with, in my facility, they will not be closed for very long. Because first thing that happens, operators have to see inside. For some strange reason, they have to look inside. Never see anything in there, but they have to look at it. So what happens is they remove all the stuff that you put as, as a preventing the losses from happening. They remove this. To make things even more interesting, they put a fan right there. So, you know, those are opening losses. Then you have something that we call material handling losses. And depending on your process, that will mean different things to different people. If you have conveyor oven for paint line that has the paint parts uh, hanging on it, that's that conveyor and the hooks for the parts. If you have belt oven, that will be belt that goes along for the ride. In any case, as long as you're handling material, you have material handling losses. Even if you have a batch oven, you have a little cart that you put into the oven, you heat up the parts, you take the cart out. That cart, that's your material handling losses. Heating of the cart up, cooling it down, heating it up. So all those losses, and then we have exhaust losses on top that we already talked about. And the rest, whatever is left, essentially, it's called heat to load. And you're hoping that all the energy you put in is enough to make product that you can sell. So once you start looking at process heating efficiency in that way, you can see all sorts of opportunities to increase your efficiency without actually touching the process itself. So the heat to load or heat transfer to product itself is driven by product requirements, of course. If you have to have a paint line, if you have to powder coat it, you have to have temperature of about 370, 380 degrees F. And it has to be there. That part has to be at that temperature for a certain amount of time. If you have to if dry your product from 80% to 10% moisture, you have to evaporate a certain amount of water. That water, that energy that is required is that heat load. For most processes, as I said, determined by those two formulas, process mass heating and water evaporation. Usually on thermal side, we don't deal with the refrigerator guys who will then worry about the other side of actually freezing stuff. So for our purposes, mass heating, water evaporation rule. But the same principle can be applied to changing the state from um, liquid to frozen. Same principle applies. So we will do the first exercise now in your workshop book, in your works activity book. You will have an example one. It's a rotary air dryer, for example. Operating under atmospheric pressure, it's nothing but a big drum. We have a, a burner on one side that is fed by natural gas, preferably. 
we feed ambient air in it, and that ambient air comes out of the exhaust. As it, and the reason we have that air is because we're going to put wet product into this, into this rotary dryer that keeps rotating. It's going to have 80% moisture, 1,000 pounds load, 70 degrees F going in. And let's say we had determined from our lab guys, we determined that the specific heat of that product going in, mixture of water and the product, is 0.9. On the other side, we put all this energy to get dry product out, 10% moisture going out. So energy balance approach, as we said, increase the process heating efficiency. And one way that energy balance approach teaches us to increase that efficiency is to maximize heat to load. So if you have all these things where energy can get lost along the way to the load, let's reduce all those losses. That's what energy balance tells you. So minimize or cover the openings. Maintain or increase the insulation levels. Schedule to maximize the loading of the conveyors. This is very important. There's many people who will run paint lines and then hang something on the hooks every 15th hook. And you go, I have been to many plants where they paint small parts, really small parts. But because when they started in the 70s or 80s, as we all know, we lost some of the manufacturing, we changed some of the manufacturing, their ovens and their conveyors were designed for 10 times the weight of the parts that they use today. So you have this massive bell, uh, conveyor, massive hook, and then you have a little tiny part. And then you load every tenth to boot. I mean, what will happen is you will essentially heat and cool the conveyor 40% of your energy will go there. Your part will only consume between 5 and 10% of your energy. So yes, maybe we cannot invest money into changing the, the oven. We understand that. But maybe we can load them differently. Maybe you can run them 12 hours every two for two days and then not run paint line later. And again, if you can quantify the benefits, it's easier to go to management production scheduler and say, can we do this because this is on the line? If you just say, I want to do this, scheduler will say, well, for me, it's easier to schedule it this way, so tough luck. But if you tell it to the management, if we do this, you're going to save $100,000. Now the, the dynamics of, of the proposition change. Uh, use different material transfer belts if you can. Reduce the operating temperature. And most people will now say, I can't reduce my operating temperature. Absolutely not. And between myself and Paul, who's just stepped out, we can tell you that I have seen data packs now from probably close to 15 paint line operators in our service area. I can tell you that one was actually correct. 14 used way more energy than they needed because they're, when, you look, when you run the data pack, for those who don't know, data pack is a, is a measuring system that you put through the paint line. It measures the temperature of your part. It measures the temperature of the air. Essentially, it gives you an idea how your oven operates. So you put it on one side on the input, you get on the output, plug it into your computer, you get the, what we call a profile of temperature in the oven. 14 ovens had completely incorrect profile. 14 of them needed to do combustion test on their, on their uh, combustion tune-up on their burner and clean out the ducts that bring the hot air into the oven. And they could reduce the operating temperature from 420 to 375. Because what happens with time, the, the ducts start to plug up so the air doesn't flow evenly. Your burner is not tuned up, so you get a little bit of um, uneven combustion. So you don't get proper bonding or curing of the powder. And of course, nobody looks at that except the operator who says, oh, I don't get enough curing. What to do? Increase the temperature of the oven. So the oven goes from 375 where it was commissioned to 380 to 395 to 410. Nobody knows any better because powder is cured, quality control is satisfied. Nobody looks how much more it costs than it should. 
So when I say reduce operating temperature, it doesn't necessarily mean reduce it from the original setting. It's more get it back to the original setting and resolve the problems that cause it to go out of whack. And minimize the exhaust volume. That's very important. Because the more exhaust you have, the more energy goes up the stack that you will never get back. And another thing that people say, I can't do that, I can guarantee you, you can. We'll do a little exercise later on on, on how to do it. But that's the basic principle behind the energy balance approach. Let's minimize the losses so that our product um, heat, the, the heat to load actually is maximized, given the same input into the system. Second one, heat uh, exchanger effectiveness approach. It's defined by the formula that heat exchanged is essentially heat transfer effectiveness times delta T. That's all it is. So UA is heat transfer effectiveness. It's a product of heat transfer coefficient and heat exchange area. And of course, based on that formula, if you just look at the formula, the higher UA, the more heat you're gonna get exchanged. So if you can increase your UA, essentially, your process heating efficiency increases. Simple as that. The other side of the formula is, of course, the delta T. The higher the temperature difference, the more heat will flow through it. The closer you get in temperature, the less heat will have um, affinity to actually transfer from one to another. So it's a hell of a lot easier to transfer heat from 100 degrees F to 20 degrees F than it is to 50 degrees F to 30 degrees F. So the more the heat you transfer, the lower the temperature of the exit of the hot side, which means your heating efficiency has improved. Again, one of those simple principles, when you stop and think about it, it makes a lot of sense, but lots of people don't practice it in real life. And what does that do when, when you think about it? What, what actually means to us? So it means effectively that unlike the other one where we focused on the losses and minimized the losses, this approach teaches us that if we increase the surface area, so if you have a heat exchanger, and you, the more surface area you have, the more heat you'll be able to pull out of it. You can use counterflow heat exchange because that's more efficient. And you can reduce operating process temperature because that increases the delta T, which increases for the same burner's uh, temperature, it increases the amount of heat that can be transferred. The middle of the counterflow heat exchange is another one that can be applied not only in heat exchanger itself, but in many processes. I've been in one plant where they had oven, and ovens usually have exhaust and uh, supply air. Well, they had supply air where, where the burner was feeding the hot air on the same side of the oven as exhaust. Unsurprisingly, they were complaining about uneven heat through the oven. What do you think happened? It did the short circuit. It went in, and instead of air flowing through the oven, it actually just went out through the exhaust. So they had to put a lot of hot air to try to increase the temperature inside the oven further down the exhaust. So if at all possible, in all applications, try to have source of heat opposite towards exit of the, your process and have um, supplier and exhaust, try to have close to the in inlet of the product. Because what that will do is it will transfer the heat. The heat will flow from the counter flow to the product flow. You'll get the most benefit from the exchanging of the temperature before it gets sucked out through the exhaust. So that's another way of looking at the same thing. Heat exchanger effectiveness looked at for the ovens, which most people would not think about. So everything else, the rest of it on the process, we have the behavior of materials at, at, at boundary layers. We have all those fine points that are really affecting the fundamental science of your process. We are really not trying to change that. We're not affecting that. Sometimes, to change a setting, really important setting like the temperature or the moisture level, will require looking at this. But unless you can tell somebody, if I can change this by this much and these are the savings, you will have a hard time getting people to actually even have any appetite to look at changes in your process. 
So use the basics to quantify potential effect. And then if somebody has a problem or you know that you need to find out the details of the process, how will that be affected, then use that business case to justify the study. And of course, we can help you with the study cost. So if you have something like this, talk to our ESC. They will provide you with potential financial incentive for those kind of studies. Because we know that if you, if you actually do the study and you can quantify that there is no danger, no risk to make a fundamental process, the management is more likely to approve the project. So if that step that all we all need to take, we're willing to take that step with you. So with, that's how energy flows. Energy goes from here into the end use equipment. But when you look for opportunities, we really have to go backwards because we have to go and say, for product that I have today, product quality requirements that I have today, how much energy do I need to use? That's step one. Then how does end use equipment provide that energy? Then how do I deliver that energy? Then we need to energy converter system. That's how you find opportunities. That's basic process. So what we'll do is we'll do that through what I like to call three R's. Reduce, recover, replace. And in that order. So step one. Reduce. So that goes back to reducing the end use requirements. And why do we have to do that? Don't use more than necessary because remember the entropy. As you use more than necessary at the heat to load stage, you're using also more than necessary in all your losses along the way. So reducing the end use requirement will reduce all your losses automatically by roughly the same percentage. That's why you always look at that step first. If you don't need to use it, don't use it. Because even if you generate energy and you have no losses and you have 100% efficiency, which never happens, but if you did, you would produce 100% efficient waste. <laughs> which may be efficient, but it's waste. So let's reduce the waste first. Let's get rid of the waste. Then we'll worry about the rest of it. So we already touched upon some of those. Increase your combustion efficiency. Very important to keep the burners clean. Reduce operating temperature. Reduce exhaust volume, material handling losses, openings, and maintain your insulation. And just to give you an idea, typical values for conveyor oven, and I'm using conveyor oven here only because I found this independent research on the, on the uh, for one of the oven manufacturers. That's why I'm using this. Sim similar things will apply to every other piece of equipment. So if you have 100% going into the energy, on average in North America, conveyor oven will store about half a percent of that energy inside itself. Half a percent will be lost to the openings. Shell losses will be about 16%. Material and heat and handling losses will be about 17% on average. Your product will consume 22%. And 44% will be lost in the exhaust. This is not one oven. This is not a very bad oven. This is average North American conveyor oven. 22% of your energy goes in where you need it. The rest is lost. And this is what we have to keep in mind when we talk about improving your process. There's a lot of ways of improving your process heating efficiency without actually touching your process. So when you go back and you say, well, exhaust loss is 44%, obviously, first thing to look. Interestingly enough, when we go and talk to people about their ovens, first thing they want to do is they want to insulate the shell further. That's the first thing everybody wants to do. But you lose twice, three times as much in your exhaust. And it's about five times as simple to reduce your exhaust as it is to insulate your oven. So, 
you know, let's take a look at these exhaust losses. Let's see what we can do about it. We had a workshop a year ago or so, but only devoted to ovens. But I think this was worthwhile bringing back for more than just paint line ovens. This applies to any oven, any process oven that we have. First of all, why is oven exhaust so high? What happens? On the typical conveyor oven that's used in, say, paint industries, what will happen is you will have something called purge requirement. And purge requirement means that TSSA and down in the States, NFPA, can light up your burner. You have to purge the volume of the oven. You actually have to purge four times oven volume before the burner can relight. So that means that four times the oven, so let's assume it's 20,000 uh, cubic feet oven, you have to purge 80,000 CFM before you can light the burner. And of course, I don't know about your production facility, but in my production facility, we were yelled at if something was late. So everybody wants this purge requirement to be fulfilled as quickly as possible. We don't want to wait more than 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes for this purge to happen because otherwise you have to start shift earlier. So a result is huge purge exhaust volumes. To get 80,000 CFM out in 15 minutes, you need a lot, 80,000 cubic feet out in 15 minutes, you need a lot of air movement. So you have purge fan that is very high volume. And when these, most of these ovens were built, VFDs were very expensive. We talked about it a little bit in, in, in passing. 10, 15, 20 years ago, VFDs were not unheard of, but they were very big, massive pieces of machinery that people paid thousands and thousands of dollars for. So people didn't want to have them on their ovens when they purchased oven. So they had a fan that was fulfilling purge requirements, and that fan stayed on while they were operating the oven. Now, interesting thing happens with the oven. As you start your regular production, now your requirements for what fan needs to do according to TSSA and NFPA change. You need to satisfy combustion volume. So you need to get combustion volume out of the oven. You need to have some containment air, and you need to have enough turnover in the oven to prevent buildup of the solvent fumes below the lower explosion limit. So that's basically what this graph is saying here. For convection oven, you have purge requirements at the beginning. Then you have combustion air requirements, turnover requirements, and containment to make sure that you don't have too much leakage out of the oven or into the oven. These three are actually operational exhaust requirements. So once you purge the oven, you turn over to operational exhaust requirements. Funny thing is, those operational exhaust require requirements today for most of our customers, because most of them went from the solvent-based paint into the uh, water-based paint, turns out to be about one-fifth of the purge requirement, which means you're exhausting about five times the amount of air that you need to every time after you light up the burner. So one way of getting around that is to actually install VFD on your exhaust fan as a post retrofit, because today VFDs are fairly inexpensive. And it's easy to integrate it into your burner logic. You need to have a TSSA approved, but it's easy technically to do. And we can help you out with TSSA approval. We can help you out with a finance uh, incentive to find out what the uh, benefits are. And we can ultimately help you with implementation as well. So for example, we will go through one of these examples later to give you an idea of what the, what the payback is for this kind of application. But for the start, let's try to calculate uh, on our example number two. So this is the input into, into the system. We have burner rating of 3.5 MMBTUs on our oven in our example. We have solvent load of 1.4 gallons per hour. And that comes from the fact that even if you have no solvent today in the powder paint, you need to calculate 9% of your volume of the paint needs to be taken as solvent. TSSA requires that. 
So in this case, that was 1.4 gallons per hour. Your operating temperature is 370 degrees F, ambient temperature is 70, and we measured exhaust on our oven to be 5,495 actual CFMs. So that's the basis of our calculation. What formulas are we going to use? We're going to say that uh, volume uh, flow of the exhaust that we require in SCFM, once the purge cycle is done, is equal to the volume flow of the combustion requirement plus volume flow of turnover requirement. Furthermore, volume flow of combustion requirement is 183 times burner rating. So we said 3.5 MMBTU. Your volume flow requirement for combustion is 183 times 3.5. For turnover, it's 10,651 times solvent load in 1.4 gallons per hour divided by 60. We will also use conversion between actual CFMs to standard CFMs by multiplying standard CFMs by what we call correction factor. And the other way around, you can get SCFMs from ACFMs by dividing by correction factor. For 370 degrees F, correction factor is, I believe, 1.57. It's listed in your workbook. And we will use formula for energy taken by heated air. And that formula is one point, simplified formula is 1.08 times SCFM times delta T. But when you really look at how this formula was arrived, derived at, it's mass times CP times delta D. So we go back to one of the basic formulas of this workshop. Mass, CP, delta D. When you convert mass and, um, into S SCFM, when you account for CP of air, that's roughly 0 0.073, uh, 0.25, you get 1.08 times SCFM times delta D. But we go back to our basic formula. So if we use those formulas, we can then calculate the stuff in, in your workbook. There will, be required, there will be places where you can calculate stuff. So let's, start, let's try to calculate this example. How much air we actually use, uh, exhaust air we use, and how much we need. So hopefully everybody else got the same answer. But even if they didn't, the point was to go through the exercise. The most important part is to see here the exhaust required is far less than exhaust that we have in the oven for purge requirements. And even though this is an example that's made up, it's very close to actual reality that most of you will see in your ovens. So that difference of 2,700 SCFM, as small as it may seem based on like 2,000, translates in almost a million BTUs every hour that you use that oven. So the key is to remember that there is ways of reducing your energy usage and increasing your process efficiency without negatively affecting your core process. And this is one of those examples that works almost for everybody who has an oven. As a matter of fact, this slide here shows a project that we have actually completed with one of our customers. So our example in the workbook was a made up numbers based on some reality, but made up numbers. This is actual project where we had total investment, new VFD, TSSA inspection, installation, all at about $21,000. Savings in natural gas was about 142,000 cubic meters in an oven. Which means that uh, at 25 cents per cubic meter, $36,000 savings. That's only natural gas. There's also a reduction in electricity usage, which we didn't assess for that particular project on our side because they applied for the electrical incentive. But the simple payback just based on natural gas was half a year. So about six, seven months, they paid back $21,000 investment. And not only that, but now for every year there and after, they'll be saving the same amount of money by simply reducing the exhaust requirement once the oven goes out of the purge. 
And lots of people had, when we originally started with this project, lots of people had the misunderstanding of how TSSA was going to handle it. Nobody likes to deal with TSSA. But TSSA was very helpful. And what you've done now through this exercise is essentially what TSSA asks you to do for your approval for, to go ahead. Show me the calculation, show how much exhaust you really need, and show me the fail safe so that if we have these say, uh, fails, it fails in a way that exhaust goes to maximum. The basic requirements. It didn't take much. Even with TSSA inspection, total cost project was $21,000. And I would be very confident saying that nine out of 10 ovens in our surf, uh, franchise area can see savings in similar levels. So that's an example of the project and, 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 and the gain that we can get through just by reducing your exhaust levels. So the second one is recover. Now that we've gone through the whole thing of let's reduce it, we reduced everything, we found out all the low-hanging fruit, we got it. So now we, there's a certain amount of waste heat we will not be able to avoid no matter what we do. No matter how good we are, we cannot avoid it. So let's recover that waste heat. Let's not let it go completely to waste. Let's try to recover some of it. And heat recovery had got a, a bit of a bad name because a lot of times you get these pre-engineered solutions that are very complex, therefore very expensive, and they're not tailored to exactly what you want anyways. But really good projects for heat recovery are usually relatively low cost. They're simple to implement, and they have payback of less than two years typically if they're really good and well designed. So some of the examples, re recover your air compressor heat. It's amazing how many people still don't do that. Recover exhaust heat. Recover process water stream heat before sending it to the cooling tower. Or preheating loads. I had a customer who used um, uh, water cooling loop from their welding machines, before they send it to the cooling tower, they actually put it through their paint line tank system, pre-wash tank system, and they use that heat to preheat the solution for washing their parts before they get painted. It was as simple as taking a loop, putting it through the water before it goes into the cooling tower. It was very effective. It saved them about 120,000 cubic meters a year. Um, Recovering of air compressor heat. I cannot tell you how many times nobody has recovered air compressor heat. And usually this air compressor sits somewhere in the, on the side because they like to run cold air in, so they're usually enclosed from the rest of the facility. So you don't even get the benefit of the radiation to heat your space. Recover that air. Put it into the space. Offset some of your space heating load. Preheating loads. Lots of people have melters or um, heat process ovens or something like special aluminum melters. I've seen a lot of them who don't preheat their load. Nowadays, you can buy actually cool, uh, what they call tower furnaces, where the load is essentially put into the tower through which exhaust is passed. So it preheats your load as it goes out. It's tremendous savings. Yes, that's much more investment. These are not cheap, and not everybody can do them. But the idea of preheating the load can be applied everywhere. Exhaust heat, we all heard of economizers, feed water economizer, condensing economizer. Condensing economizer, most people when they think about condensing economizer, they're like, why are you talking to me about condensing economizer and process heating? The best project I personally have ever had was putting condensing economizer on the top of the boiler to recover heat for the process heating loop. I didn't even heat the feed water from the condensing economizer. I don't care about feed water. I cared about, about 15,000 pounds of water that was heated from 60 degrees F, uh, 50 degrees F to about 170 degrees F every hour for 8,000 hours a year. Savings were about 15% of the facility's overall gas consumption for investment of less than a quarter million dollars. So lots of people don't equate those two. You don't have to use condensing economizer only for the feed water. You can use it for the process water as well. 
Now, lots of people have lots of process water, and they will have a boiler for certain process, and then they will preheat that condensed economizer. They will use it for feed water, but then they will use something else to heat the water over here, usually steam. So there's ways of recovering the heat. And now we'll go back. I'll give you an example. Uh, this is not a work example. This is just I'll go through it because people usually say, yeah, that's all stories, but I don't really know how this works. So we had a customer who had a compressor, motor, you know, the compressor principle. They have what they call air end, where they squeeze the air, they take the ambient air, they squeeze it, they compress the air out. This particular case, it was a water-cooled one, so the water went into the jacket of the air end to cool the air end because compressed air, to compress air for eight times the volume, takes a, a tremendous amount of heat. And about 80% of the heat in air compressor is waste heat. So they took the, they take the water, they cool the jacket of the air compressor, and they send it to the cooling tower. And they repeat the process. Well, why don't we put the heat exchanger in here? So what they did is they put the heat exchanger, they cut the pipe that goes into the cooling tower, put heat exchanger in, this, in the loop, and on the other side of it, they put the process water. They'll leave it on. They did the, on the hot side, on the compressor side, water went in at 100 degrees F. It was coming at 90 degrees F after this heat exchanger. You have to remember, this is about 120, 130 GPM of water going through that loop. 300 horsepower compressor that runs 8,000 hours a year. So on the other side of the heat exchanger, we put cold water coming out of the city, 50 degrees F average, at about 30 GPM, and 90 degrees F water coming out. So this is actual project. Again, numbers are actual project that has been implemented and it works. $21,000 of installation of the new heat exchanger and the new heat exchanger itself. We save just shy of 230,000 cubic meters per year. And the payback was about three months. As a matter of fact, when we went to visit this customer and when we said, oh, you have this compressor, why don't you do this? We came back to visit the same customer a month later. He already had it installed. And when I asked, wow, that was really quick, he said, it would be unfathomable for me not to do it now that I learned that I can do it. This is a real project as simple as that. It doesn't require much. And again, recover the waste heat. Otherwise. This doesn't account for the fact that the, now the cooling tower has reduced load as well. Right? And they use useless water. There's lots of benefits to this kind of project. So why is it not done more? And uh, even though it's very simple and inexpensive, there's really Basically, no risk to negatively impact the facility. If it doesn't work, just bypass the heat exchanger. I mean, really, no risk. But very few people know about this kind of application. And you need heat sink. This would be very hard to implement if your heat sink is on the other side of the facility, because you would lose a lot of heat transferring back and forth. But about half of you have those conditions. Ready to go. There's also nowadays you can buy air compressors with the, in what they call heat recovery option built in. So they prepackage the whole thing on the skid. And if we work with you together, we can actually finance, we can provide you financial incentive towards that additional incremental cost of the heat recovery option right off the bat. But most of you will have. Uh, air compressor already installed. You can use it, if not for process, at least for space heating. But this project was perfect. When you have water cooled compressor, you can recover a lot of heat. 
one more thing that I would like to turn your attention to is we have a portal. Uh, for those of you who haven't registered yet, you, if registration is free. Um, it's available at the www.embridgegas.com industrial portal. And one of the calculators there is actually a calculator for how much heat you can recover off your air compressor. It's one of, uh, I believe, what are we now at, 15 calculators, Carolyn? 13. 13 calculators. So condensing economizer, feed water economizer, air doors, um, HV, better HV system, um, reducing exhaust on the HV for, uh, for uh, heating and ventilation. Uh, we have a whole bunch of calculators there that is free for you to access at any time. And then if you like something, you can press a little button and it will tell us to contact you. We will not bother you otherwise. You don't have to be afraid that just because you go to our website, somebody's going to call you in the next five minutes. Um, we don't like doing that. We figure that we give you information, we give you enough that you can start thinking about it. Then when you need our help, we hope you call us in. Third one, replace. So we tried to reduce usage. We recovered some of the waste heat. Now there is nothing else left but replacing of the equipment. That's the last part. And why is it last? Is because I find that in today's environment, it's very difficult to win funding for new equipment. Um, it requires a very strong business case, and it depends a lot of external factors. Whether your corporate office, general corporate office, wants where do they want to invest, what's their priority, what is the strategic direction they want to take the corporation in. And secondly, energy efficiency is often taken as an incremental. So I, I can give you my own example. We were buying a paint line, brand new paint line. It was two and a half million dollars or something like that. And add-on was $50,000 worth of energy efficiency package, which was additional insulation, VFD on the exhaust. That was about 10 years ago. Um, so that was additional. So we put that in because it makes sense as a plant. For us, it reduced operating expense. But it was turned down at the corporate level. The first thing that they struck, do you really need this energy efficiency package? No, we don't really need it. OK, out. So we know that that can happen. So our program is there to help you. If you have such an initiative where you can see there is something that you can add on to equipment when you're buying it as an incremental for energy efficiency, Come and talk to us, and we can probably find a way of incentivize that incremental cost. Because we like to catch that at the very beginning. It's much harder to buy a new piece of equipment and go back, back to your management a year later and say, you know that shiny piece of equipment we just bought for millions of dollars? I want to add something to it. It's a really good idea. It's really hard to justify. It's easier to say, well, you know, add-on is $50,000. Enbridge will contribute X amount of that. That will reduce. We'll see if we can help you out with that. So that's the right time to involve us. So as I said, most people will tend to buy exactly the same thing. It reduces the, uh, the risk to the person who's buying it dramatically because it's exactly what we have. You can't tell us that we tried something different and new, and of course, that scares everybody off. And the cost pressures usually drop this energy efficiency where we come in and we can actually help you out. So here's a, an example of one of those things. Okay. This is exercise three in your book. We'll do one more example, and then we're done with examples for the day. So essentially, we have an oven that has a burner with natural gas. We take ambient air in, and we heat our product. As we're heating our product, we transform it, we, we transfer it through the oven on a belt that comes back as it finishes the cycle. So it's endless belt. We have nine foot wide belt, 30 feet per minute. We will measure the temperature of the belt entry. And it exits at some different temperature. It has its own CP. It has mass. These are the inputs into it. So we have speed of belt for existing belt and proposed new one. Temperature of the ovens, belt types, how many hours it operates, belt width. We measure the temperature of the existing belt at 175 degrees F and 385 at the exit. 
new belt will be 115 degrees F we measured and 410 degrees F going out. We have the mass of belt per foot squared and we have a CP of belts in either case. So what formulas are we gonna use? First conversion formula. Speed of belt times width times mass times 60 gives you how much pounds of belt goes through the oven per hour. Energy that goes into that belt, you'll recognize the formula. Belt load, which is mass, times CP of the belt, times delta T. Again, we're going back to the same one. Mass times CP times delta T. And how much natural gas that consumes? We take the energy that goes into the belt, multiply it by the operating hours, and divide it by the conversion factor of 35,733.72 to get cubic meters out of the BTUs. So if you would do a quick calculation on your workshop, on your workbook, we'll come back. Excellent, thank you. So to recap, in this particular exercise, we replaced the steel belt going through the oven with a synthetic type. Obviously, synthetic type doesn't suck up as much heat, therefore we can save some energy. For our conditions, that turned out to be almost 101,000 cubic meters of energy per year with the replacement of the belt type. There will be cases where your belt type is significant to your process. If it absolutely has to be steel, there's nothing you can do about it, that's fine. But if it doesn't, this is one of the ways to save energy. And again, it's, the idea is not for you to copy exact idea, but to start thinking in a, in a ways for your, how it applies to your process. What can I change to maximize my load benefit? That most of the heat that I generate goes into the load rather than to all these ancillary things along the way. This is an example of actual project that we've done where we replaced one belt type with another one. For about $45,000 investment, about $18,000 payback, uh, savings, for about two and a half years payback. Now this does not include side benefits of that. Steel belt is very heavy, so when you replace it, it causes health and safety issues. And also I heard that there, there is less spoilage on the system with this belt. So th those are not included here. These are just thermal energy benefits. Of course, there will be a whole benefit on electricity because your drive doesn't have to pull this massive steel belt around. But again, actual example, real life example, how this works. And these belts have to be replaced anyways on certain periodic way. So going back to our original um, idea of process heating, how complex it is. Yes, we're not specialists in everything. We don't claim to be. None of us go into your facility and say, we're going to show you how do you, you should run your facility. I, at least I hope none of you do it. Um, if they do, let me know. <laughs> uh, because we have better jobs for them then. Um, but we know how to quantify energy efficiency improvements. Once we know what drives the energy usage. And guess who's there to know what energy drivers are in your facility? You. You are best positioned to know what your process requires. What are the buttons that you can move? What are the buttons you shouldn't touch? So working together, you know, we learned a thing or two about the processes and, and how to improve efficiency of the process without messing up your career. Because that's really bad for the relationship, by the way. <laughs> we tend to not get repeat projects from people that we ruin. <laughs> So we tend not to do that. Um, so these are some of the types of applications that we helped our customers with. We worked on the pollution abatement on RTOs, uh, regenerative thermal oxidizer, thermal roasters. We worked with high temperature furnaces for glass processing, steel processing, aluminum melting, some heat treatment high, uh, high heat furnaces. We worked on industrial ovens, paint curing, drying. We worked on air dryers, rotary air dryers. We worked on evaporators triple evaporators with or without the thermal compressor. We worked on autoclaves. We had an example that we discussed with one of our uh, 
participants here earlier today. We had a guy who had seven autoclaves, steam power autoclaves. Just by changing the PID, how the autoclave operates, they changed almost, what was it? 400,000 cubic meters of gas. And that would never happen if we didn't talk to the customer, made sure that we are right on the edge of there when they were, it's a food customer, so they're very um, uh, serious about their food safety arrangement. So every five years they go through the process where they can document their process and they can make some changes. We were right at that time. We aimed at that time. We brought, we uh, financially helped bring the expert from Texas who does nothing but PID loops for the food industry. And we saved 400,000 cubic meters working together with this customer. Nothing was changed in the pro fundamental process. The food is still cooked. The food is still processed the way it was done before. But now the valves, the PID loops open the valves in the correct sequence. They don't open them just in case. They don't leave them open just in case a little bit longer. They run as they're supposed to be running, and they're 400,000 cubic meters richer every year since. So all of these are different processes that we work with. Doesn't mean that we are experts in every one of these processes. That's not what we claim to be. But in every one of these processes, we can go back to the same principles we discussed. And we are, really, we are very serious about risk mitigation. As we said in, in joking, we don't want to ruin anybody's career. We're very, we know that processes are the key to your survival. I used to work in a facility where we did um, coils for the automotive, for the cars. We made 16 million of them a year. I mean, no customer has ever paid us to transfer the coil from one to ma machine to the other. They paid us for the core benefit of the coil because we knew how to make the coil stronger than anybody else on the marketplace, and we knew how to protect it from corrosion better than anybody else. So those two processes are, were critical to our success. But how you transfer it, how you cool it, there's a whole bunch of sub-processes within this complex process that you can play all you want and save energy. Because guess what? All these major manufacturers, car manufacturers come to our plant every year on the dot and say, I want another 5% savings. Every year. So at some point, you can push the labor, you can push the cost of the material. At some point, that is exhausted. So where are you going to find 5% in energy? So we didn't change the process itself, but we changed everything around the process, and we saved a whole bunch of energy around the process. So we increased our process heating efficiency without endangering our key process that paid money for our survival. So we understand that. We understand the risk mitigation. And the best way to deal with it, as always, is knowledge. If you can define clearly what the scope is, what you will and you will not touch, and what is potential benefit to the management if you do touch it, it's much easier to buy that, if you will, leap of faith than it is if you just say, I just want to play around. That's just never a good approach. All of us in the manufacturing have heard this KISS principle. I made it a little bit politically correct with saying keep it simple, but it's a good old KISS principle. And most of the efficiency gains that we talked about today can be had without endangering or affecting your fundamental process principles, every single one of them. So if you calculate the energy in the as what if state, if you say, I can reduce the temperature by 10 degrees half, what are the benefits? You use those formulas, you calculate what if scenario. Now you have a good reason to go and question, can we do this? Is it worth our while doing it? Another big point for me is focus on energy drivers that either scheduler or operator can affect. Because then you know you're not affecting the fundamental process. Because you know that either scheduler or operator is already playing with those settings anyways. You're not the first one there. Even though you'll be blamed the most, you're not the first one around. So if you quantify and understand those first basic impacts on the process, now you have enough business case to either implement the change, try the change, or get more study done to see what that change implies.
back to basic requirements, heat to load. Heat energy needed to justify, to satisfy product quality requirements. That is the key. How much energy I need for that basic physical principle of either heating something or changing the state of something. That's your basic heat to load. You will never get there. You will never be 100% efficient. But at least you have an idea. Am I wasting 80% of the energy? Am I wasting 70%? Where am I? Then once you know that, if you talk to any one of our ESCs, they will tell you what the industry average is. They'll tell you, oh, I've seen a guy who can do this at 60% efficiency. Oh, I see somebody, no, no, 80% is pretty much what I've seen in the industry. Maybe it needs a new breakthrough, maybe it needs a new study, maybe it needs new basic research done, but 80% is where we are now as an industry. Or are you an outlier here and you're like, you're the only one who has 40% efficiency when everybody else runs at 80% efficiency? Who knows? But if you know, if you, can just, if you can quantify this and talk to us, we can tell you where you're at on the scale. We talked about this. For example, in the drying, drying is a very good example because when you actually calculate heat energy required to evaporate water, you will find that all the dryers out there are at best 55 to 60% efficient. And then you can focus on what is it that gets me past that. Or if I'm way behind. We had an air dryer um, example where people had actually had the dryer from 25 years ago that's way bigger than their today's process. And what happened is their burner couldn't throttle back. It couldn't um, uh, draw down enough to satisfy the minimum requirements for their process. So what was happening is actually at the minimum production levels, they were actually burning their product because they still had too much heat. So we, what we ended up doing is replacing that burner with the one that has a better um, turndown ratio. And that saved them a whole bunch of money and improved the quality. Before they had fire in the dryer every now and then. Now they have no fires and they don't use as much gas because the burner can go, um, has a turn down of, uh, I believe, 20 to 1 now. It was 4 to 1 before. So you can go to those fine, fine uh, minute levels of control that you couldn't do before. We never changed any of the heat, basic fundamental principles of his, of his air drying. We just allowed him to use the energy in the dryer more efficiently. Going back to the two basic principles, energy balance approach, heat exchanger effectiveness approach. One allows you to quantify the losses and work on minimizing the losses. One allows you to quantify the heat transfer efficiency. How good are you at transferring the heat? And in summary, I would like to leave you with two graphs. One is this. To me, this is very important. Energy flows one way, but your opportunities go the other way. Find out what's your energy requirement. Find out how your end use equipment is working. Work your way, way back to the energy converter. Because energy converted at 100% efficiency and wasted is still not as good as no energy being wasted. And the second graph, Reduce your losses. First, minimize waste heat. Because if you reduce your losses, you will reduce your requirement and requirement. If you can't reduce it any further, recover the heat. Recover the waste heat that you cannot avoid. And only then look at replacing equipment with a new or more efficient one. From the energy standpoint, this is how you want to look at your equipment. And we can support you every step of this way. So that's it for me. So if you have any questions, comments, I would be glad to answer them. Otherwise, we're done for today, and I would like to thank you for your time and for your effort in showing up here. <laughs>